Philly Startup Leaders presents Founder Factory 2015. This program was recorded January 13th, 2015 at The Hub at Cirrus Center in Philadelphia. This year's Founder Factory is brought to you by these sponsors. Broadpath, the Innovation Center at 3401, Startup PHL, and Morgan Lewis. In video number one, opening remarks from Rick Nucci, president of PSL, followed by a keynote address from Darren Hill, co-founder and CEO of Weblink. What's up, guys? Good morning. How are all of you? I'll, I don't know how to like get everyone to like give some sort of verbal commitment to energy. So maybe just like wave at me. Hi, how's everyone doing? Cool. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is our sixth ever Founder Factory. Um, my uh, first one that I've been involved with, so uh, hopefully that's not a sign of something bad going to happen today, but uh, super excited. We've got lots of cool stuff. We've got awesome speakers. Um, and uh, I am as much excited about uh, watching our speakers as I am about uh, chatting with all of you guys. So thanks for taking the time. Um, so. Wanted to say a couple things. Uh, I thought, given it's January 13th, I'd talk a little bit about uh, Philadelphia in 2014, which is a, a little bit broad sounding. So Philadelphia and sort of the startup world in 2014, um, we had a cool year. Uh, we uh, had several things happen to our, our area to the Philadelphia region that is um, targeting uh, the students at our Philadelphia universities. Um, we had Start, Stay, Grow uh, kickoff, which was um, a partnership between PSL and Technically Philly and Blackstone and Campus Philly, which is all about raising the awareness of the startup scene in Philly um, to the students at our, at our universities. Um, we uh, were excited to see Blackstone's Launchpad initiative come to town and open up in um, Temple and Philly U. And if uh, there are students that are working on startups that uh, go to those schools, you can literally walk into the Launchpad and tell them what you're doing and they will um, connect with you, um, help you network, help you find mentors, help you move your idea along. Really, really cool stuff. Um, Pen apps, which I just learned from Fabio, is going is this weekend and is its 11th uh, Pen apps uh, hackathon. Um, it is the largest hackathon in the country, and I have 90% confidence in that statement, but it's a very big hackathon that brings together uh, uh, the smartest minds uh, in engineering for a weekend. Uh, and the PenApps guys out of that was the PenApps Fellows Program, and those guys are set up back there, um, which is an internship program pairing uh, those um, engineers with um, startups in the Philadelphia area specifically. So really, Really um, brilliant idea, really cool thing that those guys are doing. Um, and you know, they're just volunteering their time to try to um, pair uh, startups with, uh, with those engineering interns, so very cool thing. Um, we also had a solid year of funding. There are lots of big rounds announced. Um, uh, RJ Metrics uh, closed their B round. Uh, Zonoff uh, closed a big expansion round. Um, Curalate, we'll be hearing from Apu later today, uh, closed their B round in 2014. Um, Instamed. Weblink, we'll be hearing from Darren in a little bit. Uh, People Link, Sidecar, Biomeme, lots that I'm not mentioning, but the uh, funding is uh, vibrant in Philadelphia. The opportunities to raise capital, um, it's never been. Uh, even for funding reasons aside, it's never been a better time to start a company. It's never been a better time to start a company in Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> Uh, co-working spaces, uh, City Coho on 24th and Walnut celebrated their one year anniversary recently. The Miami-based co-working space pipeline came to Philadelphia this fall. Uh, the Hive is set up in Old City, which is a all-female co-working space. Uh, Venture Forth has taken on new ownership. Uh, he's sitting in the back there, and when you walk in there, uh, it's starting to look more like a music festival and less like a co-working space, and I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, and Walnut Street Labs uh, 
launched in Westchester. And uh, do we have any Wall Street Labs guys here yet? I think they're coming at some point today, but those guys are doing awesome, uh, awesome stuff. If you live in the Westchester area, again, on Walnut Street, walk in, introduce yourself to people. Very, very cool, cool thing they're doing there. Um, so Philly Startup Leaders, so uh, I took over this role in December um, of last year, uh, 2013. So I've been at it for a year. Um, I've definitely, when people ask me what I think about it, definitely uh, seen the light, I guess, for lots of reasons. One, it's uh, greatly accelerated um, my awareness of all the awesome things going on in Philly. Uh, I continue to see new things happening that I didn't know about. I continue to hear about new startups, meet awesome people, um, working on startups, very cool stuff. Um, and, you know, P with PSL specifically, uh, I have just observed a very engaging and open community. And that's demonstrated on our listserv. Um, and those of you that read our listserv, if you've ever uh, reached out and asked for help, uh, you more than likely got a response back with someone offering. Um, if you reached, uh, you know, moving to the Philadelphia area and you write to people like Bob Mao in the back there, you will likely get an answer back from him, despite the fact that he uh, is uh, fairly busy and has a certain <laughs> Certain, uh, certainly a full schedule going on. Um, but that's, uh, that's what uh, PSL is trying to do. It's trying to create a connected community uh, of entrepreneurs and founders. And you know we're all volunteers. None of us are, are uh, getting anything out of this other than uh, developing relationships with, with each other, um, which, is, which is what I, what I really like about it. And I think, too, um, you tend to see a lot of uh, rooting for each other going on with Philly startups, which is really cool. You know, ha uh, have any of you heard of Y Combinator, the startup uh, accelerator? Right, they're the most, by far, most successful accelerator in San Francisco. There's lots of obvious reasons why they're successful, but perhaps a non-obvious reason why they're successful is um, that the alumni that go through that program have a motivated connection to help each other out. They're rooting for each other. Oftentimes, YC alums become the first customers of other YC alums. And as we're gonna hear today with Traction, getting those first customers is the hardest set of customers to get because no one knows who you are, you have no uh, proof points yet, uh, you're just starting up. And so, you know, YC has manufactured that uh, and, and, and done a brilliant job in creating it. And I think um, uh, we're doing that uh, here. And I think we need to continue to do that here uh, to make the Philadelphia region continue on the uh, nice upward trend that we're on. So we should be um, continuing to root each other, root for each other and feel motivated um, to, to help each other along. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and I, I observe that with PSL and I love that. So um, today's event, uh, I don't know where Rachel is, but you'll see Rachel walking around. Uh, Rachel Robbins is our events director. The uh, event today 100% would not have happened without Rachel. Um, so uh, can we give her a round of applause really quick? And <laughs> Rachel, if you're out there, we're thinking of you. Uh, and uh, Yuval Yarden, who's standing right there in the back, um, is also one of the driving forces towards getting this uh, event organized. And you'll often hear me refer to today as Yuval's show, because that's probably technically accurate. So, uh, so uh, thank you to Yuval Yarden. And uh, can we get a quick round of applause for her as well? So. Uh, we recently launched a new website, um, phillystartupleaders.org. Uh, I wanted to quick, give a quick shout out to Kyle Fiedler. Uh, I don't know if Kyle was able to make it today, but um, Kyle uh, and his company, ThoughtBot, uh, donated their time. There he is. Uh, the, his, his, uh, uh, all of the uh, credit for uh, the, the, the beautiful website that is now Philly Startup Leaders goes to Kyle. Um, Kyle and ThoughtBot uh, volunteered their time uh, to build our site. And um, so big thanks to them and uh, Michael Idinopoulos, uh, David Whitaker, who, uh, who, who are on the PSL leadership team who kind of pulled it together and made it happen. Um, so uh, today, um, why, uh, why we're so focused on traction? There's a lot of reasons. Um, one reason is that, um, that uh, lean startup is a very well-read and very well-covered concept and idea about how to get 
um, a product from, you know, in your head uh, into the hands of customers. Um, and traction is kind of the, the then what happens after that, right? And, and, and not really talked about as much. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting uh, maybe why that is, but, um, you know, so we, uh, in, in, in connecting with all of you guys and hearing what was important to you, wanted to um, put a day together of topics around um, traction. And so what you're going to hear today is um, case studies. Basically, you're going to hear from uh, founders and early stage executives who have um, achieved traction. Every single speaker you'll hear today has achieved traction with one, if not two, of their startups. Um, and they're going to share with you how they did it. And they're not going to share the traction about how they got from, you know, 1,000 to 10,000 customers because uh, many of us aren't in that frame of mind right now. They're going to share how they got that first set of customers back when um, nobody knew who uh, Gabe Weinberg and DuckDuckGo were. Um, how did they actually get, get off the ground? So, um, so uh, really excited about that. Um, our sponsors are flashing through on our slides, um, so huge thanks to them. Uh, we've got a couple of um, quick comments that I'd like to first ask uh, Tracy Dowling from Morgan Lewis to come up and say a few words. Tracy? Good morning. My name is Tracy Dowling, and I'm an attorney at Morgan Lewis in the Emerging Business and Technology Group. Um, we have been really proud to be a supporter of Philly Startup Leaders since its, since its inception um, and are active in the startup community here. And so my colleague, Jeff Bodel, um, will be here a little later as well. And we're going to be here throughout the day, and we love talking to companies. So to the extent um, anyone wants to talk to us now or later, uh, we just are always happy to have a cup of coffee chat um, and help the Philly community grow. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> and uh, I would also like to ask Mr. Ben Schmela to come on up. And uh, Ben is with First Round, and Ben is going to talk about the uh, startup PHL funds that uh, they have recently announced. Thanks, Rick. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Schmela, and I work for First Round here in Philly and also help manage the startup PHL Seed and Angel funds. Um, really excited to be here today. I'm new to Philly, uh, relatively new anyway, and it's exciting to be getting to know all of you over the last few months. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, maybe through the listserv, maybe through Technically Philly, maybe through a tweet or two, um, on February 2nd, we're going to be hosting an office hours at the first round office. And we're encouraging everyone here, I'd encourage everyone here to sign up if you'd like to spend uh, 15 minutes with uh, Josh Koppelman or uh, Chris Freilich, partners at first round, uh, pitching your startup. We'd love to meet you. Um, this, uh, there is no actual landing page for this sign up, but you can find it in Technically Philly, PSL Listserv. It should be pretty easy to track down. Um, 2014 was a great year for startup PHL. We got to invest in companies like Tesorio and Veriapt and Squareknot. And we're really looking forward to getting to meet a lot more of you in 2015. So if you have any questions, I'll be here throughout the day. And I'd love to help, them, uh, help you get them answered. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Ben. Cool. Um, so the uh, agenda will be flashing up and down on the slides, but founderfactory.com, uh, you can pull it up on your phone at any time during the day if you want to check out the agenda. Um, also, uh, this year's Founder Factory includes a free health benefit, uh, which is a nine block walk from here to the happy hour happening after the show today. Uh, we hope you guys will join us for uh, uh, happy hour at the City Tap House, which is at 39th and Walnut. Um, there is an Uber code if you're not yet an Uber customer, um, which uh, I did not write down, so I don't know it, but I'm sure you can find it if you ask around. Um, but probably many of you already are an Uber customer. So 39th and Walnut. Uh, and then finally, um, here uh, to kick things off, um, my advice to you guys would be to uh, engage with each other, engage with the speakers. Um, every single speaker has told me that their hope is that you will ask them questions. Uh, most of them will be staying around as long as they can to answer your questions and connect with you. So uh, I encourage you to take advantage of that. So. Um, 
Cool. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, and kick things off. Uh, leading us off today, um, and as I mentioned, one of the companies that closed uh, a, a B round of uh, venture funding last year um, is uh, Darren Hill, who is the co-founder and CEO of Weblink. Darren. All right. Hi, I'm Darren Hill. It's great to be here. One of the best things ever about today is that I'm going first. Um, I do a lot of these presentations, and going last is the worst, because you're sitting in the back. Sorry if, if anyone is going last and you're doing this. But you sit in the back, you work on your deck, you change things based on what everybody else said, and you spend the entire day stressing out. So I'd like to thank you for putting me first. I don't know how that happened, but I'm very, very glad. All right, so first about me, um, CEO and co-founder of Weblink. I'll spend the majority of the presentation talking about that. Um, also uh, founder and partner at National Mechanics, if anybody knows that place. It's, you know, if you're over 21, it's a great place to hang around. Um, also partner at Lucha Cartel, which is our newest restaurant on Chestnut Street. Um, great place for Mexican food, if you like that. And I'm also uh, pretty involved in commercial real estate, mainly in Old City. So about Weblink, Weblink is our company. Um, founded Weblink in 1994. Uh, I was a freshman at Drexel in 1994. The timing was perfect to start a uh, internet related company. Uh, as many of you know, it was the first full year that the web was open to the public. Uh, Drexel was the first university to wire every single dorm room um, to the internet. Um, so I started in 94, that was the first year. Um, my brother and I had started a mail order business selling clothing, traditional mail order, sending out catalogs, that type of stuff, um, when I was in high school. And then we were making uh, printing catalogs and sending those out to our customers, and it was, uh, you know, catalogs are expensive, dips into your beer money when you're in college. So we said, wouldn't it be great if we could not do catalogs? That would be wonderful. But how would we get customers? We put the catalog online. It was very early days, non-transactional, nothing like e-commerce today. You literally printed out the order form. While you looked through the catalog online, you filled it out and you still mailed it in. But it was amazing. It was super high tech for the time. Um, so I'll go, go through a lot more of our history. Um, headquartered in Philadelphia, we have uh, three different offices in Old City. Uh, we kind of treat Old City as our corporate campus, which is actually kind of wonderful when the weather is nice. Yesterday was terrible, but other than the, the weather, it's, it's wonderful. Um, about 120 employees and uh, a little over 100 clients in total. So what Weblink does, and I think this is like the only slide I have that talks about what we do, um, we, we are an e-commerce platform company, and what that means is our software operates and runs the e-commerce websites for our clients. Um, the, you know, it's, it's a kind of a big piece of technology that manages lots of things, manages the customers, the inventories, um, all of the catalog health, all of that type of stuff. Um, but besides the technology, we also have strategy, we have design services, and we have just general consulting services to help our clients kind of get up and running. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with like a Magento or something like that, um, our clients typically graduate from a Magento as it's, you know, they're, they're doing too much business and it's, it's not working for them any longer, and they come and, uh, and, they, and they go with us. So we've got a ton of great clients, a lot of great brand names, a lot of uh, amazing companies that we've really, really enjoyed working with. Um, some of the most recent ones, Do It Best, uh, up in the corner. This area, Do It Best, is not wildly popular, but they're a uh, hardware store. They have 3,800 stores. Or, uh, most of them operate as franchises. For that project in particular, we're doing 3,800 individual e-commerce sites that all run off of one major catalog. So it's just total insanity on, on that project. Um, Nasty Gal, fastest growing retailer of uh, 2013, we took her from three million in sales to about 200 million in sales. Um, a lot of great companies, I, I wanna go through them all here. But for the purpose of this presentation where we're talking about getting your first clients or getting any clients, um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about what our typical client is because what, what we're selling is not kind of fill out a form online and get a free 30 day trial and then we've hooked you for, for five bucks a month or something. Um, our, our stuff is, uh, our clients are typically doing between 10 and $200 million online. Um, that's just, you know, just their online revenue. They may have stores and something like that. Um, 
for us, <clears throat> a typical implementation, so we sign up a client, that implementation is going to take four to nine months. It's going to cost that client somewhere between two hundred and fifty and five hundred thousand dollars. Our sales cycle is about six months. So from the first time we start talking to a client to the time they sign contracts, six months, which is obviously a lot of time to put in. Um, it's high touch. I mean, we, we really have to consult with that client that we're the right fit for them, and we have to go back and forth on lots and lots of things. Um, and then once they're up and running, there's a license fee that it's kind of a subscription fee where they can get the updates to the platform, um, they, you know, any, any types of, uh, of you know, patches or, um, or new features or functions. And the client's paying on average somewhere between ten and $40,000 a month uh, for those services. Um, so as you can imagine, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a long sales cycle, um, a lot to think about for the client. So traction. Um, I thought this one was really interesting for me. Um, Rick had asked me, you know, hey, pick pick one thing on this list, and uh, and tell us, you know, how, how that worked for you, and and you know, really focus on that one thing. And um, I, I, I tried, I did my best, but I didn't do it. Um, but I thought this quote was fantastic, um, and everybody can obviously see it here. But you know, if you can find one one focus for traction um, that, that you're going to be you're going to be successful um, for our business we've been in business for over 20 years we've had a, a very different business at different stages and what I've done is I've identified the different stages that our business has had and the different areas of traction that we needed during those stages so here's all 19 that, that were identified these are the 16 we've used so I've grayed out the ones that we haven't I'm sure those work great for 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 other businesses and these are the six that, um, that have been very, very effective for us. And again, um, for our type of sale, for our type of client, these things work well for us. Um, obviously, they might not work for, for other businesses. So our timeline. <clears throat> In 1994, uh, when we started the business, we were essentially a web development shop, strictly. Um, we weren't focused on anything. Um, there weren't a lot of people buying websites at the time. It was very difficult to sell, especially as an 18-year-old kid. Um, to tell somebody that they should take money out of their marketing and their IT budget and put it in this new web budget. People really weren't, uh, well, they, they weren't buying from me. Um, so it was a difficult time. Um, then in uh, 1998, um, we decided to um, focus on startups. So we, before that, we were going after restaurants, we're going after any small business, anything we could, but the dot-com boom had started. And what we saw was there was a whole lot of money going into this, this startup community where you had a few people with really good ideas, but they had no way of doing the project that they needed to do. Um, so we had those, those resources to be able to do that project. Um, so that's, that was really what our focus was. Um, and the startup thing was fantastic until it wasn't. Um, and I don't know if many of you remember, but um, at one point it was just wonderful. And about two months later, it was, it was the end of the world and the dot-com bust. Um, so for us, in 2001, we had a lot of clients that had just gone out of business. They were startups that couldn't get their next round of funding or whatever. Uh, but we had a lot of clients that were still paying their bills. And uh, we looked at, at those clients, and those clients were all doing e-commerce and all selling real things to real customers. So for us, we said, hey, let's just focus on the e-commerce business. Let's just implement other people's software, get our clients up and running on other platforms, and, and that will be our whole business. In 2003, we decided, hey, let's build our own platform. We were implementing these other platforms for, other, for, for these other companies. Um, they weren't very good. Um, it was still kind of the infancy of e-commerce. And we said, hey, let's build our own platform. That'll make sense. We can then just you know, get out of implementing other people's stuff. Um, and that worked, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back through all of these and talk about what worked at each stage. Um, in 2005, we added um, hosting services. Before, before that, we were not doing hosting. We were essentially, um, we were the first call if the site went down, but it, none of it was, was our fault, but we had to, um, had to deal with all of that. Um, so we said we should be making money at the hosting part because all we're doing is, is helping these other companies host poorly. Um, in 2007, we decided to go after B2B. So these are companies that are selling directly to businesses. They're usually very, very complex from an e-commerce standpoint. People are buying thousands of items per order. Um, so it's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's much more complex than you, know, you add a, a sweater size medium color blue. Um, these, are, these are much more, um, you know, the, just much more complex systems. Um, we saw that as a big opportunity for us. We had a lot of clients, or a lot of prospects coming to us that had very, very complex B2B needs, um, much, much more complex than anything else. We said, let's, let's get, get a go with this. 
Um, 2009, we started looking at reoccurring revenues. Um, so that was something we really, really hadn't focused on too much. We, um, we weren't doing long-term contracts with our clients. We were allowing them to, uh, to fire us at any point in time. Uh, what we decided was if we can get our clients, give them some type of a discount, some type of a break, get them in a long-term contract, it will make more money over, the, over, over, over time. Um, in 2012, we launched, we basically rewrote our entire platform to be an API-based platform written on new technologies, blah, 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 blah. It's you know, exactly the same technologies everybody's excited about. We did that as well. Um, 2014, last year, we added a licensing model. Um, so before last year, we weren't licensing our technology. We we're literally giving away our technology and making money on the services side of uh, supporting that technology. And so we, so we changed that. Um, this year, what we're looking at doing is adding third-party implementers, so other companies that will implement the WebLink technology. And this year, next, we're looking at buying a, basically an order management system company. Um, so basically what happens when somebody buys something online, we typically pass it to an order management system that will make sure it can get picked, packed, and shipped in the warehouse and the, the order can be further dealt with. All right, so now I'm going to go back through that list and talk about what we did at each stage of our business and what worked. All right, we're halfway through. Okay, um, so when we started the business, um, there were two founders, my brother and I, he was focused on the technology, I was focused on the business. This is very, very important. Um, one of the quotes from the book says something about spending half of your time on product and half of your time on, on the business side of it. Um, if you have more than one founder, it's very important to find somebody that, that can focus on the business side of it. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to get tons of founders because you know, mo people, mo problems, but uh, I would suggest finding somebody that's, that's good at the business side. Um, what we did in 1994, as I said earlier, it was very difficult to sell. Um, we really couldn't, uh, d didn't do a good job of convincing companies that they should, that they should go with us for their websites. So what we did, and what worked at the time, was we talked to a bunch of ad agencies in Philadelphia, and we said, hey, your clients are gonna ask for, for websites within some type of uh, you know, campaign that you're doing, brochure, whatever. Outsource that work to us. We can do that work. Um, and that worked well. That's how we got our first clients. Um, it wasn't gangbusters. It was very slow going at first. But um, we were able to learn a lot from these channel partners, from these ad agencies. They were able to teach us sales, project management, things like that. So for growing our business and kind of hitching our, uh, our cart to them, um, it worked well not just in getting new clients, but also in gaining business knowledge. So that, that one was a, was a good one. In 1998, um, we switched to focusing on startups. <clears throat> it's funny to think that we're a, a tech, internet-based company. Direct mail was very important. Um, sending out physical letters in 1998 worked. Um, we also did a lot of email marketing, but that, was, uh, that wasn't actually as successful as, as direct mail. The other thing that worked really well at the time was networking events. Um, during that, that stage of the uh, dot-com boom, there were tons of different networking events where everyone was getting together and talking about their great new ideas. For us to go there as a, as a service provider was fantastic because we could talk to the founders. We could also talk to the venture capitalists, and whoever just recently got money was obviously a prospect for us. All right, so in 2001, we were somewhat forced to change our business model. <clears throat> but in deciding to focus on e-commerce, it was a niche market at the time. Um, there weren't a lot of people doing it. There were a lot of people doing it wrong. Most of the e-commerce sites were kind of homegrown systems um, written from scratch, didn't work very well, were not secure, didn't scale when they, when they had a big sale, anything like that. So for us to decide we were gonna heavily focus on that, um, there was a big opportunity where there wasn't a lot of competition in those days. <clears throat> in 2003, when we launched our first e-commerce platform, it was also when we hired our first salesperson. I know someone's going to talk about you know, the, the steps to take when you hire your first salesperson. For us, we screw that up for years. Um, but literally, for years, we, we hired the wrong people. And I think what we, what we were doing was hiring someone that was young, that was inexpensive, that could figure it out. And uh, it wasn't until we, we hired someone that had done sales in our industry successfully um, for a competitor uh, that, that we really were able to then all of a sudden move the needle with sales. So if you're looking for a salesperson, that would be my suggestion, was find somebody, you're gonna have to pay extra, I don't know, maybe it's equity, whatever it is, um, but we wasted a lot of time and a, a lot of, uh, we lost a lot of momentum, I think. Um, so that person did a lot of cold calling, which uh, again, is a little bit old school. 
but it worked. Um, calling on companies that were <clears throat> doing e-commerce, um, that worked. We would call the CEOs, we'd call the, uh, the chief marketing officers or the tech, uh, tech people, and that worked very, very well. Um, <clears throat> 2005, when we added hosting, this was a new service we were, we were adding, and this was something that we, you know, new business line that we were able to sell to existing clients. Um, that was very, very easy and effective. Um, so once you do gain some traction, if you're looking at adding new, new services, um, something that your existing clients are going to buy is, uh, is definitely my suggestion. <clears throat> to put that in perspective, hosting became 25% of our overall revenue within a year. Um, so that, that was effective. <clears throat> um, 2007, again with the B2B, I'll skip the cold calling and print ads, <clears throat> but trade shows. Um, trade shows, again, seems very old school. Excuse me. But it works. You have people that are looking to buy your product, your services, whatever you're doing, um, and they're walking all around in one giant room. The negative is you know, all your competitors are there as well. But, but, but you know, if, you, if you're looking to meet new prospects, uh, that, that works. <clears throat> Shifting the, the emphasis on recurring revenue, again, that goes with um, selling new services, new products to existing clients. Very effective. I, if I could say that 20 times, I would say that 20 times. <clears throat> and then the licensing model, again, something, something new, a new way for us to, uh, to, to get revenue. Around that licensing model required us to do a lot of internal, let's say, upgrades to the, uh, to the software. So one of the things we decided to do at year 20 of our business was raise our first round of venture capital. Um, up until last year, we were organically grown, basically putting the profits uh, that we made in our business back into the business and growing the business. That works really well if you want to retain all of the equity and if you think that, that you have all of the tools internally to, to drive your business. Um, for us, we came to the realization that, that we didn't uh, have uh, all of the tools inside our business uh, to grow it in the way we wanted and that we could grow a whole lot faster and meet our goals if we could raise some, some venture capital, have some money in the bank to be able to hire faster. Um, and two places that we really focused with that venture capital, and it's only been six months, and it's been a good six months, but it's only been six months. Um, the, the two places, one is obviously making updates to the product, but that last one, um, <clears throat> making major changes to our sales organization. So um, the beginning of last summer, we had four people in our sales department. This is our sales department now, which is a lot more than four people. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but traditional sales, um, we were able to add a lot of people to help us uh, grow the business. And um, you know, again, only six months into this, but we're looking at closing more business in this month than we closed last year. Um, so the money's working, at least so far. Um, all right, <clears throat> so 2015, as I said, we're looking at having other companies implement the Weblink software. Um, so this is affiliates uh, selling the Weblink system on their own. Uh, we think this is very important. We can't find every lead out there. Our, our, our giant sales team now uh, is not going to be able to find every single lead that's out there. Uh, they don't, they're not gonna be able to have every relationship possible. Um, so having these third party implementers, they're going to be able to find those uh, new customers and bring them to us. <coughs> and the last one on the list, buying an, an existing company that already has clients. This would be very, very new for us. We've never done anything like this. Um, but when we buy an OMS provider, um, order management system provider, um, they're already going to have revenues. They're already gonna have clients. So there's a big opportunity there for us to sell them our e-commerce software and for us to sell that order management software to our existing clients. Um, something that we're, we're planning on but obviously haven't done yet. So again, just wanted to kind of review. These were the these were the ones that worked well for us. Um, we've had to just for the length of our business and the way our business has changed, we've had to find different traction at lots of different areas at different times. Um, the first one being that we teamed up with companies that already had clients and already had processes, and that was that was very very lucky for us to do. If we wouldn't have done that first one, we probably wouldn't have survived. And that's it. Any questions? Do you have a uh, six-month sales cycle? Are there things you're looking to do in the next year or two to shorten that or focus on 
Yeah, so the question is um, around our six month sales cycle and if there's something we're doing to try to, uh, to, to make that shorter um, or more targeted. Um, no, yeah, I th I, it's a good question. I, I think it's, it's probably unfortunately gonna go longer. Um, as the sophistication of our client base um, increases, um, their requests increase, and our system needs to do more and communicate more with, with their business. Um, it used to be e-commerce was this little thing on the outside of their business. Now it is the heart of their business. It's the nucleus. And um, the, the requests and complexity of the system actually have, have gotten, gotten larger. Um, so unfortunately, I think it's going to get worse or just longer, I don't know if it's worse, but. An evolution as it goes to bigger yeah. customers. Yeah, it is an evolution. Um, I wish it, it, was, it was less. Um, each, obviously, the, the longer it goes, the more expensive it is, the more people we have to have on that sales cycle. Um, but I honestly, I see it getting longer, and I think that's, I, I don't see how that's gonna change. So, uh, especially in the early phases of the company, are there any customers that you, potential customers that you sort of know to, or needs that you decided uh, uh, not to pursue? Uh, yeah, the question is, um, were there ever prospects that we turned down? And the answer there is absolutely. Um, you, you have to do that, um, especially for our, for our business. We're, we're working with that client, you know, just on a implementation basis, it's four to nine months. You're going to get to know that, that client very well. Um, so for us, if any, any red flags come up, and there are lots, um, at different times it's been different red flags. During the end of the dot-com bust, we were looking very heavily at someone's financials. You know, we don't want to sign a client that isn't going to be able to pay their bills at some point. Um, but usually just personality. You know, we, we want to enjoy our lives and work with people we want to work with. And if, um, if someone's a screamer in the sales process, they're going to be a screamer during the project. And uh, we don't want to work with people that treat us like shit. The question is, um, how much pain did we go through figuring out which channel was going to work um, at different stages? And that's sometimes it was really painful. You know, you know, um, in 2001 we were probably going out of business. I mean, it was it, our stupidity is the only reason why we're still here. Um, so that was incredibly painful. Others were just more, much more natural. Um, so adding third-party implementers. It's very natural that they're going to do their own sales and, and, and bring us new clients. So I think the most painful was when the business was really going out of business in 2001, which the whole industry was. Um, and that was painful um, for a whole host of reasons, but difficult to, to make, the, make the leap to say, hey, we're just going to do e-commerce. I mean, we were at a stage when we, could, we, were, we would clean toilets to, to keep the doors open and the focus say, hey, we're going to not expand our focus but limit it. Um, that was difficult, but it was the right decision. It worked. Um, at that point, you did not look inside the living room customer base. And at what point did you uh, pull each of the work with these? So the question is, at what point did, uh, did Weblink decide to work with companies that um, were only doing, you know, the, 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 the lower end, 10 million in sales? Um, I think that has just gradually changed over time. Um, at the beginning, it was, uh, you know, we would, you know, I think the number was $5,000 in maybe 1998. Is, was like, we won't do any project that's, that's lower than $5,000. Um, so that's changed over time. But really, from the way that our technology works and the way that our process works, um, it's, it's so high touch that if a company's not willing to spend that amount, they're probably not a prospect because they're, they're, they don't need us yet. Um, if, they, if they aren't willing to spend that total amount, they don't, aren't, they're not going to have the needs and the pains with other systems, and it's probably not going to be a good fit. They're going to get into Weblink and say, well, you know, this, this is just too complex. There's too many things going on because their business hasn't matured enough to, uh, to, to warrant all of the bells and whistles that, that we offer.
The question is, has, um, going from consulting to uh, more of a software license business, um, has it cannibalized any of the, the consulting business? Um, hasn't, no, the size of the engagements is, is increasing, um, but the cannibalization will happen when the third party implementers get up and running. And we're, we're not talking tons, we're, our goal is three, to add three this year. Um, but that will cannibalize some of our, uh, our consulting revenue, and we're, we're okay with that, because the consulting revenue is fairly low profit, where the licensing revenue is, is high profit. Um, so you know, that, that is really one of the, one of the main reasons we, we, we raised venture capital too, because we knew there was going to be a little bit of a dip in some of the consulting stuff, at least in the beginning. And um, you know, we wanted to be able to be able to handle that well. Um, but our goal is to make most of our revenues in 2016, most meaning at least 51% uh, license revenue. So if, we, we hope it's cannibalized. The, the question is, <clears throat> when we expanded the sales team, was there a formula that we used um, pr to figure out basically how many people we're going to use? Um, there are different formulas that we looked at, and usually it's just a percentage of OpEx or, or whatever. Um, we really based it on need. Um, so we said, we, we know we need somebody that's going to run the East Coast. We know somebody's going to have to run the West Coast. We know that people are going to be having to make 100 cold calls a day. How many calls are we going to have to make? How many people do we need on the phones? So that's, we, we really kind of did it in much more of a, I would say, practical standpoint of figuring out our needs. And, and we're learning. We're, I'm sure we've screwed up half of it. Um, but I, I don't think there's, I, I don't think following a formula would have made it any better. Anything else? So the question is, what's easier now and what's harder now being a startup versus in the in the 90s? Um, gosh, I think that uh, what's harder now is that um, bullshit doesn't fly as well. <clears throat> you know, people know what they're buying and more. Um, you can't be like, yeah, we can do that and not have any idea what it is and figure it out later. That, that happens a little bit less. Um, what's easier is the technology is just so much better. Um, the, what's easier is the market's bigger, way bigger. Um, what's easier is, um, especially in Philadelphia, there, there's a network like this. Um, this didn't exist in 1994. I mean, it just totally didn't. We had to go to Boston if we wanted to go to uh, you know, a, you know, some type of an event like this. Um, so that, from a, a startup thing, that's the, the, the community in Philadelphia is, I mean, it was nothing when we started. And now it is, it's significant. It's, it's really exciting. Yeah. When we got to the VC stage, was there something that we that w was more that was evident that we should be doing more? Is that what's the question? Yeah, from the first <laughs> Yep. Yeah. So what we learned of what we should have done from raising money, um, what we should have done was raised it earlier. Um, I think we had this kind of DIY punk rock. We're from Philadelphia <laughs> attitude, and. Uh, I wish we wouldn't have been so proud, and I wish we would have raised money earlier, because I think we could have just grown faster. Um, so that, that's definitely a regret. I, I wish we would have done it done it sooner. Um, so on the flip side of that, what are the, the challenges that come with taking on VC? Because I've heard from, from other founders that they actually took it on early and, and just struggled because of that. Can yeah. you help us understand the trade-off? Yeah, the question is, what were the, uh, the the negatives or challenges uh, with with accepting venture capital money. Um, you spend a lot of time uh, for your accounting people and your finance department doing things that they didn't used to have to do. That's been a big sense of uh, stress on that team. Um, I mean, we're only six months in, so it's, we're still in the honeymoon phase. You know, uh, I can't think of anything that's. Um, <clears throat> Anything besides the resources on kind of having to deal with making sure our finances are, are, are the way that someone else wants to see them. Um, I can't think of anything else. Um, like we went with Safeguard Scientifics. Um, they're great. 
Um, the team that we're working with there is fantastic. So um, we, it's not a scenario where they're coming in and trying to run the business for us. They're just trying to be helpful. Um, so that was that was important for us. We actually had four term sheets um, given to us, and so that, that's rare. Um, we were able to choose between four different investment uh, firms, and they all had different structures and all of that. What really came down for us of, of why we chose Safeguard was the people we were working with um, during the transaction uh, were going to be able to stay. I was convinced that they were going to be able to continue with our business, and there was a, a good relationship there. With some of the other firms that we were dealing with, the, the highest up of people in those firms, and I knew that as soon as the transaction happened, they would be on to trying to be in the, the sales mode of what VCs do versus being in the help web link run their business mode. So that was, uh, that's why we chose that. Um, still six months in, but so far so good. Yes? How big of a challenge <clears throat> is it for you to recruit technical talent? And how do you think that your, the, this challenge compares to what it would be like to get both in a different city? Yeah, so the question is um, the challenge around um, <clears throat> hiring technical talent, and it's very challenging. Um, it, it is. I mean, literally, we, we started a, a bar restaurant, National Mechanics, with the, the main goal of, is it using it as a recruiting tool. Um, you know, and it, it worked. <clears throat> We've made a lot of hires there. Um, but yeah, that's a big challenge. That's hard to do. Um, we, we, I think in Philadelphia, we have the luxury of having, you know, it's a university town. So getting people right out of school is, is pretty easy. And, you know, a lot of the schools have incredibly talented kids coming out of them, but they're kids. Um, our challenge has been more in hiring the managers or people that have been in the industry for m multiple years and convincing someone to come to Philadelphia from, say, San Francisco is, is very difficult. But convincing someone to come to Philadelphia from Baltimore or York, Pennsylvania, or you know anything like that is is actually much much easier. Um, so it's it you know hiring is is the, the limitation of the business, right? Um, so it's it's a challenge, but I think that Philadelphia has a lot to offer. All right, thank you. Thanks, Darren. We hope you enjoyed this program. For more information on Founder Factory and the Philly Startup Leaders, visit phillystartupleaders.org. We produce this program in the studios of the Lubetkin Media Companies in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at beingthemedia.com. For everyone at Philly Startup Leaders and the Lubetkin Media Companies, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care. <laughs>